Hey, welcome back everybody. Things have been crazy. Not a lot of videos coming out, but today I did want to share something that I thought might be interesting to some of you. I wanted to share an interview that I recorded with Josiah Hester, who is a friend, a colleague, and a former student of mine. We talk a little bit about the work that he's doing, which is really exciting, really cool stuff, and some interesting connections between computing research and the situation in Maui with these recent wildfires. I'm still figuring out how to get great audio out of a Zoom recording, but I hope you enjoy it. Hey, welcome, Josiah. Welcome to the channel. Thanks for being on here today. I thought we'd start out just by you introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about yourself and how you know me and maybe a little bit of the origin story of our relationship. Yes. Thank you so much, Jacob, for having me. So yeah, I'm, I'm Josiah Hester. Aloha. I'm a professor, associate professor right now at Georgia Tech in college computing. I work a lot on embedded systems. I did my PhD with this guy. At the best place in the world, right? The best place in the world with the best football team in the world and the best flavor of orange that you can get. Sorry, Tennessee. Sorry, <laughs> Florida. Yeah, the origin story of I mean, it's interesting. So, you know, Jacob, you, you maybe remember some of this, but you taught around 2012 a class called Mobile Computing. I was a newly minted master's student in computer science. I was just trying to get out. And I think even you commented at one point, try to get out fast and get to Google or wherever to go make some money and be done. Research, what is that? And I showed up to mobile computing. I was like, oh, easy A with a new professor. <laughs> Got to check that requirement off. And I thought it was going to be iPad apps. I thought we were going to make like phone apps or something like that. And then I get into the class with uh, all my other bright eyed, you know, green or wet behind the ear cohort. And you hold up big eyes like, and this is a mobile computer. And you start talking about how you're putting this little thing in your hand on the back of turtles and using solar panels to power it. How you're running around in the swamps and wetlands of Mississippi. And that was a, I remember leaving the class like buzzing, like, what? I did not know that we could extend the realms of computing beyond like this, you know, virtual digital space, right? Maybe I just hadn't been as aware, but that was a really interesting moment. Uh, then, so, you know, of course we took the class. Um, it was a good time to talk and learn more about each other and, and work and understand this whole field of embedded computing, right? And eventually, I think I still was on the track to try and do a master's. So this is like 2012, right? Over yeah, a day. In fact, I think, I, I think, and we should make this part of the public record, that the oh. first thing you ever said to me was, hi, I'm Josiah Hester. I'm a master's student and I don't want a PhD. Oh. <laughs> That's my memory. That is the first thing you said in that class. Wow. Yeah, that, that probably sounds about right. I mean, obviously things turned around, uh, headed up at tech. And I think it was even that summer, like we were working together and worked in that first paper, learned about research, you know, got all the good Jacob Sorber wisdom. Uh, and then that turned into a bunch of papers and eventually a PhD, right? I mean, that was with a lot of, you know, things on the way, yeah. of course, that one does when doing PhD work. Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot of different stories that we could tell, a lot of different things we could talk about, uh, you know, reminiscing about the old days, maybe, I don't know, one or two fond memories from from grad school? There's a number that stick out, of course, you know, from the, uh, hey guys, I got bees. Uh, and then showing up one day when you got stung by a bee and that just being, is that Jacob or is that anyway? Uh, it's a famous character from a movie, but maybe one of the, the most sticky memories I have was when we ended up at your house, a bunch of people in the lab, you know, someone brought Ruffles potato chips covered in chocolate, which was a transformative experience, like flavor experience that I've never had before. And then played Settlers of Catan. And I've never seen so much passion <laughs> for a game uh, as I saw that. You really find out how intense the competitive spirit in the lab is when you get... Get everyone around and, Settlers of Catan. And everyone's so like relaxed outside of that, you know, moment. But once it's Settlers of Catan, everything changes. And you're like, wow, that was a ruthless move. You just took all of my property. <laughs> it was uh, quite, yeah. quite the thing. So yeah, good experiences. Obviously, many other like crazy experiences, racing to paper deadlines and all the good graduate school stuff. But you know, those those definitely stick out. Yeah, me too. Tell us a little bit. What have you been doing since you left Clemson? Since Clemson, I went to be a professor at Northwestern up in Chicago or in Evanston if you're from Chicago, because being from Evanston, I can't claim that I'm from Chicago. Anyway, and you know, worked out a lot on extending these ideas that we explored around batteryless, wireless, embedded systems and computing and how those might be a potential answer for a more ecologically sustainable, maintenance-free internet of things. 
And so those ideas you know, we, that we've germinated and talked about and built a bunch of systems together, I then explored in the you know one idea around uh, a battery-free Game Boy. Can we demonstrate how a device that is interactive, right? I'm playing with it. It's doing interesting things. Mario is jumping around on screen. Can I actually take the batteries out of this you know 90s toy that I grew up and loved and make it work completely off of both solar panels, but also my thumbs and the motion of them um, as they're going in and out. So we built a whole emulator. This is like a nine month effort uh, with, you know, friends at TU Delft in the middle of the pandemic. So there may have also been this thing of like, we need to do something fun, right? There's so much going on. And also with that backdrop of climate change of, well, look, by building this device, this computational sustainable thing, that is you know, powered by renewable energy sources and even the human body, this is almost like a design provocation of, hey, we as computer scientists and technologists uh, and manufacturers and, and builders of electronics, we can do better, right? And trying to address these you know, climate change and degradation effects. And it's also just fun and cool. So that was, I think, a project that's really cool and interesting that we got to play around with a lot um, that you know, started in the PhD as like, huh, that might be fun. And eventually, you know, after years, right, turns into these new projects. It's always cool to see that kind of long tail process of creativity uh, from, you know, I think I even talked about this with you maybe in class a decade ago, right? And then it yeah. becomes this really cool, you know, publication and work. It has been. I mean, back then we just had, there were a handful of people in the whole world working on batteryless computing. And it's now, you know, there was a time when people were like, no, seriously, is this ever actually going to be a thing? And now people are starting, it's building some momentum and we're seeing some really cool systems come out of it. And yeah, it's very, for me as well, very satisfying to watch this happen. It's almost like, you know, we're the cool kids now. And we were like knocking on the door to be like, let us in. <laughs> right? So I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a really interesting, transformative experience also just to see papers about batteryless systems that were not published by us right kind of right. never thought that would happen <laughs> and it has right um, it's, it seems to be making an impact i'm very happy about about it definitely now also as 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 your career is moving forward also i've noticed that your career has been very informed by your heritage right your background you want to tell us a little bit about that yeah and i'm uh, so i'm native hawaiian so um and native hawaiians we call ourselves a kanaka maoli and there's a difference too i should say between native hawaiians kanaka maoli and locals on the islands of hawaii so kama aina um, so native hawaiians we are the original inhabitants indigenous inhabitants of the hawaiian islands so thousands of years ago some would say less than a thousand others would say many many thousands like it depends on who you ask. Uh, thousands of years ago, though, we traveled from Aotearoa, known as New Zealand, and settled on the shores of, we think, Maui and the Big Island. And then we you know, went in these voyaging canoes. So you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Moana, right? Uh, something like that. Uh, these traditional navigation techniques, these open canoes, you know, took ulu breadfruit on board and lived and sustained off of that. The navigational techniques to figure out where we are amongst the stars and eventually landed in this place and built this very sophisticated, like even technologically sophisticated, communalistic, agrarian society, right? So lots of controlled agriculture and things like that. And so that kind of you know technology tradition of Native Hawaiians, even though maybe you're like, oh, this is ancient ancestral kind of ideas. Well, those ideas of like, wow, I'm using my hands maybe to look at the location of stars. I'm using very simple tools that anyone can make to understand my place in the world. That really resonates with me. I mean, I think maybe you and many other makers of like, this is a way that we can make computing or other technology very accessible and do more uh, with you know maybe less materials, right? So that kind of access plus sustainability is, I think, how a lot of the uh, native Hawaiian Kanakama Oli ideas and tenets come through. And I think you and I, even early on, right, even batteryless things in some sense, it's like we're just looking at, well, do we really need a battery in this? Like someone, people just decided to have it in there. Why? <laughs> if we could take out one component and it still works, that's good, right? So I think a lot of that you know, way of thinking, and I'm not claiming that only Native Hawaiians can think of this way, of course, but that's where a lot of, I think, my culture came through 
um, as I view the field and as I've kind of grown and, and moved along. Yeah, I just think that's really cool that, that I mean, you come from a beautiful place with a culture that a lot of us don't really understand very well. And I just think it's really cool that that's been something that you've been able to take into. Like, I don't really think about connections between Hawaii and computing, but I think it's really cool that that has informed your research the way it has. Yeah, no, thanks. It's exciting. It's it's fun. It's fresh. Yeah. But I mean, there's definitely like this, you know, unfortunate, maybe sadder backdrop in history, right, to Native Hawaiians as well. We do view this, you know, amazing, beautiful place. Uh, I mean, it's gorgeous, right? Love it. There's just so much natural beauty and these amazing resources and, and everything. Uh, wonderful people. But, you know, the unfortunate reality is because it's so such a des- destination, it also has this very troubled history. So after those you know, early times, right, ancient Hawaiians, we went through this time of turmoil, right? So we had a self-governing, sovereign, very advanced nation. Because you know, often you think of like, oh, you know, it's Native Americans or Native Hawaiians, right? Maybe they weren't as advanced as us, so we did them a favor. But really, Native Hawaiians, we had freaking electricity and flush toilets before the White House. And that, I mean, just kind of thinking of that, right, is like a weird juxtaposition for many people. We were part of, you know, pre-UN bodies that were uh, interested in global governing and organization, making ambassadorial trips back and forth to the Queen of England uh, and others, right, and had frequent kind of connections with the U.S. So all of these things were in the backdrop until, unfortunately, around uh, 1893. And that that date is a, or that year is a really big one in, in every Native Hawaiian's mind. The U.S. government organized and supported a coup to actually overthrow uh, and imprison our last sovereign queen, uh, Queen Liliuokalani. Um, and I should say that, you know, this is not just me saying this. So actually the U.S. Uh, apologized for this uh, overthrow, um, Bill Clinton, in an apology resolution. Uh, and so Queen Liliuokalani had to give up Hawaii. And eventually, despite, you know, a, a very huge petition that my own ancestors signed to protest this annexation, eventually we did become a territory and we did become a state, right, as we are now. And so that was a difficult time, right? And even after that, that time from the overthrow to around, I would say, 1980, um, and I was born in the 80s, I was pretty dark because our, our culture was very marginalized, um, oppressed. Our language was outlawed for a long time. Uh, so my grandparents, as an example, all have uh, white person names. Right? So Herbert, uh, Frank, uh, Frederick, uh, Elizabeth. Right. So these are all you know, names, uh, whereas, you know, very, very traditional Hawaiian names of, of Frederick and, and John. Right. Uh, and this was to fit in. Right. And to try and code and you know, carefully hide uh, the culture that they were trying to preserve. Uh, if you look at Hawaiians nowadays, so my, my daughters, right, Lena Ala, Kalehiva. Right. We're back to embracing that culture because we now have the opportunity to really engage with it, understand it without kind of being as much repressed. And so there is this you know, long history. Right. Um, like, you know, I was born in North Carolina, not Hawaii, right? And we migrated back to Hawaii because we couldn't afford to live there when my grandmother's time. So, so all these things kind of sit in the background and are these, you know, sadder and more unfortunate parts of the history, but they are an important part of that history of the islands and also of, you know, technologists and computer science folks who come from the islands. Just say Native Hawaiian, you know, coders are the best. Just going to throw that one out there. Uh, and we'll just have to find out later in some type of organized competition, but I think we're pretty good anyway. So, you know, don't discount us just yet. Sounds like a challenge. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a lot of heaviness in the history. And of course, we've seen in the news recently, you know, they're going through again, a really rough time brought on by these fires. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. This has been a really hard time for I would say, you know, Native Hawaiians on and off the island. So for those that don't know, there was a major wildfire just in the past couple of weeks in Maui and the city of Lahaina, mostly. Um, and for context, you know, over 100 people have uh, already been identified as passed and over a thousand people are missing. And this, I think, already is the worst wildfire in modern U.S. history for the last century. So it's really just completely awful. I'm just... I, We've been really in shock, honestly, uh, everyone in in the community and outside on what's going on. And this doesn't just affect you know Native Hawaiians, this is affecting locals, so Kama Aina, um, who have lived there for decades uh, alongside Native Hawaiian folks. What's really painful, I guess, about the fire, you know, of course, beyond this incredibly terrible loss of life, is that these 
disasters we saw coming and the disasters kind of still ongoing in the sense that we saw it coming because early on, we saw all of these plantations in the driest part of the island that were just long grass. And so you just have this city that's just sitting by this giant pile of kindling. You have, you know, hotels and golf courses that are being set up that are using most of the water. So actually, there wasn't even water to fight the fire, right? This was the Guardian, too. So I'm, this is not just me making it up. This was a pretty well-reported piece on, like, where is the water and why wasn't this addressed? And so all of these kind of compound issues, along with climate change uh, and over tourism, contributed to this fire happening. And now we're making it difficult for people to get it out. So we are housing um, uh, displaced Maui you know, residents in hotels if we can find the rooms because they have to compete with the tourists, right? And so all of these kind of things are, I, I think, what would be called a, you know, a compound disaster, right? That we really need so many people's help right now, um, both in terms of donations and maybe even staying away um, from the island while it heals um, and really just grace and love and care. Yeah, definitely. So, and then that, just for those watching, I mean, that's what inspired this conversation. This is what got this whole video off the ground. When I first heard about this, and I, I think some other people might have this thought, and you addressed this a little bit already, but th there's a tendency to feel like, oh, doesn't tourism bring money to the island? Uh, it sounds like that's not helpful right now. Mm. Can you, yeah, just a little bit about how that, how tourism actually impacts this situation? Yeah, I mean, tourism is, I think, 21 or 22% right, of all industry on Hawaii. Right, which is a very large number daily, like residents, right, or, or people on the island is, you know, vast majority are tourists, right? And so, yes, it is a absolute, for sure, part of the economy. And Hawaii has a unique relationship with tourism. Some would say, I think that Hawaii has an unhealthy, <laughs> even abusive relationship with tourism. And, you know, I, to really talk about what that means is, you know, uh, I'll talk from my own experience, right? Um, so my family's been in the tourism business for a very long time. Um, so I guess we're either lawyers, computer scientists, or entertainers, sometimes all of the above. I'm not a lawyer, so I must be the other two, hopefully. You know, within this, we've seen a lot of different things. So uh, I've early on, right, one of my um, ancestors, who my daughter's named for, she was part of the Aloha Maids, and they were touring around the U.S. doing hula with Ray Kenny in the 30s, right? And now we, we um, dance and sing in various venues and throw luau and things like that. So we're in there. But the problem then on the other side is, you know, so my family recently, one of the members of my family uh, had to, uh, was applying for affordable housing. And you have two different tiers. So you can have, do the affordable housing and you can do the market rate. Thankfully, the state of Hawaii has decided that they're just going to enforce this affordable housing for every new development so that native, not just natives, locals can live. Well, the cost of the affordable is like $600,000, right? And the average income in Hawaii is maybe 40 to 50K. And so the math doesn't quite work. The that market rate is 1.2 million, right? So because of this kind of influx, uh, there's not a lot of land, right? Because of this amount of tourism and development and real estate just totally dedicated to tourists, as well as people that buy these, you know, just absurd McMansions, right, that sit empty most of the year. And it's a really, you know, going to Hawaii, if you're an observant person, you'll often see this, you know, um, scenario where you'll see a person that is homeless. Um, often they are native, uh, and they have a shopping cart from Time Supermarket, and it's full of stuff. And they're, you know, walking past this empty, gated, gigantic house. And you're just that kind of situation of like, how can this be? Uh, is you know really part of that burden of tourism? I mean, a bunch of other ways, right, that this happens. Companies also kind of ex uh, exploit this, and maybe don't trickle down as much of the benefits of tourism to us. There's not a lot of state pressures to get money back to locals. But all in all, right, when you have this tourism effect and then you have a disaster like the wildfires, they just kind of compound together. So now the water that I would use for wildfires, the energy I would use to support the efforts, the plane tickets inter-island, right, um, to go to Maui are taken up by tourists. And in some sense, the water that you're drinking as a tourist is being taken from a local that could have used it or at least increasing that price. And so that's tough, right? And that's why it's a challenge right now to really support the ability of anyone going to Hawaii to be a good guest, right? It's hard. A good guest maybe knows when to stay away <laughs> as, as well as to, you know, come and visit. So, and one more thing about tourism, uh, 
you know, locals, uh, even political leaders in Hawaii and a lot of tech industries that, you know, are really emerging in Hawaii now often talk about this concept of a brain drain where that poor climate in Hawaii for anything but tourism and this impact of a tourism focused economy reduces the ability of young educated professionals um, technologists like us right to really stay in hawaii and have a job that you know pays the bills pays the rent is rewarding right so we're really in this almost like tourism is replacing what could be an amazing tech industry because when i look up, out at the number of native hawaiian computer scientists and technologists oh my gosh amazing unfortunately so many of them including this guy, right, are outside of Hawaii. To South Carolina and, for graduate school, right? And go to South Carolina for graduate school. Georgia. End up in Georgia. So, I mean, you know, that is something that's near and dear to the heart. And that is not something that is necessarily going to be solved immediately. But it is that a thing that should impact how we think about Hawaii and its potential as more than just a vacation de destination, but as a community uh, and a technology forward you know, place. Absolutely. And, and some viewers may wonder, why are we talking about tourism on a computer science channel? But where this all actually started is, well, tourism actually impacts us because we go to conferences, right? It's computer science and engineering conferences are held in different locations. Often they put them in beautiful locations like Hawaii to try to get people to want to go. And so, yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about the specifics of, of that, if, if you would. I guess for some reason, and maybe just because so many folks have been going to Hawaii after the pandemic and even during the pandemic, and I say after, um, you know, after the, the, the brunt of shutdowns. So sure. ACM CHI, so Human Computer Interaction Conference, uh, as well as 4S Web, you know, STSS Conference and a number of other technical conferences have all decided that Hawaii is where they would like to have, you know, this year's iteration, right? And so in the next six, seven months, the island's going to be covered with computer scientists and maybe not <laughs> in a way that's helpful, right? You know, I would have maybe pushed back even before the fires and say, well, maybe it's just not helpful for us to be there right now because of the burden. But now with the fires, it's challenging to see how, you know, when we as computer scientists and technologists and researchers have the choice to maybe go somewhere else um, to convene a different place that would you know, be more beneficial and to have a positive impact in a, a different place, you know, we're choosing to instead stay. So one of the ways, you know, that people sometimes think is like, oh, well, we can have, you know, this conference, it's technical, we're bringing technology to the untouched, unwashed masses, right? I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, but I think we know that that's not how it works, right? <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, not right. a direct quote, I hope. I hope there's I nobody left on earth that would say that. I hope not. I'm just holding like this. Anyway, yes, I, I hope not. But that kind of idea of like, we can parachute into a community for two or three days, right? And we're gonna completely change the trajectory of you know native Hawaiian school children who don't have access to computing, who are computer illiterate or even lower literacy rates, aren't graduating on pace with their peers. Are we really gonna make a difference in three days um, by having this conference here? I think not. Are we gonna make a negative impact on them and their parents that are in the tourism industry right now and are affected by the Maui fires and are trying to care for their community. I was just going to say, a, a common to... misunderstanding yeah, that, that I would have is just that I think, to me, it seems like uh, like the, some people would just think, well, doesn't doesn't the money that I'm spending on this end up helping ind indirectly? But it sounds like it not nearly as much as, as I would hope when I take a trip yeah. someplace. I mean, that's a great question, right? I mean, I think most of the people that you pay are Delta, right? <laughs> United Airlines and those folks, and then the resorts, right? The resorts and the hotels, you know, so much of that money goes to these hotels and these conference venues also. So the conference venue of Kai, um, and really the main conference venue that can support large conferences is owned by a oil and gas company, which is, this is just like on Wikipedia, right? You know, it's, there's, there's- Not locally and, owned and operated? Not locally owned and operated, right? And so- that type of, you know, the venues that these folks choose, um, and they don't have much choice, right? Uh, it's really hard to prioritize, you know, local and native Hawaiian vendors. And even then, right, it's like, cool, you know, I got here, I'm in the hotel. All right, I'm going to go do good for the community. I'm going to go go to a local, you know, place, get some Ono grinds. Sure, you tipped them 10 bucks, right? I mean, great, but like, was 10 to 40 bucks the most? You could have just Venmoed someone, right? <laughs> 
and, and had a lower impact. And I, I think that's kind of how it is. I mean, there's other things around the tourism industry, you know, it can be pretty exploitative. There's been things around child labor laws, um, desecration of land, like lots of things that are just not fun to think about or talk about. Um, but that I think we as citizens um, of the globe and considering computing's impact on society writ large and trying to embody ACM's, you know, ethics of avoid harm, uh, really do need to kind of consider, especially if I might add from a conference like Human Computer Action, which has human in the name and diversity, right. inclusivity, decolonization. You know, we got to live by the principles, right? Maybe if it was material scientists, we'd be like, okay, sure. But like, come on, guys. Right. Human. If any conference should get it, Kai should get it. I think so. <laughs> so okay. So so specifically, speaking of Kai, what what can we do about it? What have you been doing about it? Yeah, how can we help as we you know to wrap things up? Yeah, we have. I've been doing some advocacy. You know, I've been trying to talk to the many different areas of the Kai organizing organizing committee. Uh, to help them understand kind of the impacts they've had over the past year and a half. They've been very polite, very kind, but they haven't done anything. And so, of course, I've released more information on the website, um, Kai in Hawaii, as well as started a petition on change.org. And, you know, I really say that to do things that make a difference, you know, first of all, donate to Maui Community Fund and Maui Strong Fund so that dollars can go to people that truly need it most. And those are people and organizations that for sure will support, the, all of that money will support um, people in Maui. So I'd first say go there. Also, just to mention to anyone watching, this video is part of a YouTube fundraiser, which will which is connected to the Maui Strong Fund through the Hawaii Community Foundation. And so, yeah, so you can donate just right here in YouTube and and that will, that will help out. And which is huge. And this will be an amazing impact. Uh, the other way is to go and sign the petition. If you're an active member of the Kai research community, consider not submitting a paper, consider not reviewing, consider not attending. Uh, there are so many other venues, right? Computer science, there's so many places we can send things now. We have lots of choice. Why not send somewhere that will have a lower impact um, on a community that we should care about? Well, Josiah, thank you again for coming on the channel. Thanks for talking with us, sharing some things that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with, aren't aware of. Uh, so all of you watching, I hope you can find a way to help out, find a way to support, uh, follow you organizers for Kai are, are paying attention. I hope this, <laughs> you know, hope this makes sense to you. But yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, always good to hang out with you. Yeah, Go we'll Tigers. do it again sometime. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. See you, Josiah. See ya.